Gandalf. Twenty second of February, nineteen sixty four, and Beatlemania is at its height. Hazelmere born Alf Bicknell is delivering crumpets round London, blissfully unaware of the scenes of hysteria a few miles away at Heathrow Airport. Well, I hope you can hear me up here on the Queen's Building because this is quite fantastic. But I've never been scenes like this at London Airport before, I'm perfectly certain. There have been wildly varying estimates of the number of fans here. Some say 4,000 and some say 6,000. I just can't tell. But it's pure Beatlemania. You can probably hear it behind me now. Banners flutter up. The Beatles and Alf Bicknell inhabited two completely separate worlds. They were the most successful group on the planet. He was a jobbing driver who had no way of knowing how his life was about to change. Good evening, this is Mark Radcliffe and for the next hour we'll be sharing the memories and stories of Alf Bicknell, the man who was as close as anyone to the Beatles between 1964 and 66. So how did it start? Knock on the door. Just like that. And it was this guy from NEMS Enterprises and said to me, do you want a job working for a pop group? And I said, well, what pop group, you know? He said, he said the Beatles. I said, that sounds about right, you know. I, at this time, I was between jobs sort of thing. i just finished uh, on a job. Anyway, arrangements were made for me to go to Brian Epstein's apartment over in Knightsbridge, back of Harrods. And uh, I arrived over there and he had a... He had a butler there, a guy called Lonnie, lovely fella. He said, uh, you know, come in, there's nobody who's arrived yet. He's put a bottle of scotch on the table and a large bottle of Coke and uh, said, help yourself to a drink, pack of cigarettes there. And we sat there and about half a bottle or two-thirds of a bottle of scotch later, nobody still turned up. So we, we decided to call it a day. And uh, we toddled off out, got in a cab and <laughs> arrived home, <laughs> the worst for wear. Uh, a few days went by. I thought, well, I don't know what's happening. And uh, phone rang. So, oh, Alf, you know, got the job. Hadn't seen anybody. Um, can you get hold of a limousine? I said, yeah. So, uh, we got the limousine, got this address uh, in southwest London to go and uh, pick up this pop group. And they'd been doing a photographic session with uh, Bob Freeman. So I pull up outside the place and out they pile all back into, the back into the back of the car. And George sat onto the occasional seat in this limb. You know, there's a petition there. Neil Aspinall, their road manager, came and sat beside me. I said, well, where would you like to go? And they said, well, back to King William's Muse. Well, this is where they all had apartments and they kept their cars there. And away we went. And suddenly I get to the set of traffic lights and I'm aware of uh, all these people and milling around and screaming and shouting. So the next time we move, I put my foot down and I get round the back of Harrods and in I go into the muse there and I stop a little bit quick. And George sitting on the occasional seat, his head has come forward and it has hit the petition and he has said, oh, dash, my poor head. Words to that effect, Mark. And I thought, this is it. Shortest, fastest, quickest job that Elf's ever had in his life, you know. <laughs> Alf was by now the Beatles' regular chauffeur. And as he spent more time with them, he began to experience at first hand the by now infamous Scouse wit. John's was the sharpest. Uh, George was very subtle. Ringo was uh, more, more straightforward. And... Uh, Paul would sort of, his sort of humour would slide up along the side of you and it would have all happened before you realised actually what had, what had taken place, you know. But in a crowd, with their humour, they were like vultures. And the Lennon sense of humour figured in a bizarre initiation into the Beatles' fold. After a, a very short time that I was with them, that suddenly I felt a draught at the back of me when the window opened. And up to this moment in time, I had presented myself as a chauffeur, which I had been trained to do, you know, you know, beautiful white shirt, which I, one a day, I would wear, obviously, you know, and uh, the suit and the hat and all this sort of thing. And then suddenly this hat disappeared, or I felt it being taken off the top of my head, and it was thrown out of the window. And from the corner of my eye, I could see this hat skating across the, the road. 
And then the voice leaned forward again, close to me, and said, um, you don't need that hat anymore, Elf, he says. You're one of us. In the spring of 64, Beatlemania was still sweeping the country, and, as the band toured, scenes of hysteria and mayhem greeted them in every town. But what was it like for Alf, attempting to get the lads to the theatres? We used to have some hairy moments. We would be met on the outskirts of a town by the, by the police force, by perhaps a, a car or two and uh, a couple of outriders, and they would take us right in to the theatre, to the stage door. Only on one occasion can I remember through the years of Beatlemania was when we had a problem with getting to the theatre because of the sheer volume of, of Beatle fans around it. And that was at Finsbury Park Empire. And we drove a few hundred yards away from the theatre at the instruction of one of the police superintendents or police inspector who had the organisation of, of, the, of the police around the theatre... And he said to me, um, Alf, the best thing you can do is to come straight to the front of the theatre and mount the curb and get in as close to the theatre doors as you can and we'll take the boys in through the front door. I said, magic, we'll do that then. So away we go again and we get close to the theatre and we're weaving our way but with um, a little bit of speed but not enough to do any damage until we got within about 15 feet of the door when suddenly we felt bump, bump. And I looked in the rearview mirror and all the boys' heads, I can only see the backs of their heads, they're all looking back and said, Alf, it's a policeman, you've run over his foot. And then John shouts up, he's moving, can you back up? In May 65, the Beatles were on location filming help and Alf, although part of the inner circle, was still just the driver. Not for long. We're doing the back end of the, uh, the some of the outside shots of the, the the tanks and that on Salisbury Plain and the film help. And as we were driving up to the location one morning, John leaned forward and said, Alf, would you like to come on tour with us as, as a roadie? And I sort of gulped and immediately answered yes because I didn't want to let that go because let that go. And John was so spontaneous it, that would have, it would have gone his mind was always working uh, so I said yes and him and the boys all, you know they were got everything all organised through a lovely guy that worked in the office in those days a guy called Alistair Taylor and they contacted him and said you know you set Alf up you know with everything and I think it was the next day that we were all at the uh, at the medical centre in Victoria all getting our inoculations and all this sort of thing, passports were rushed through. And the next thing I knew, I was on a plane to New York with the Beatles. Arrive in New York, you know. We've been uh, first class, champagne all the way. We get off the plane and I thought I'd seen Beatlemania in Great Britain, but nothing could have compared to what we were seeing now. And we came, we got off the plane and into a helicopter and we landed on the top of the Pan American building in New York. And uh, then straight into the Warwick Hotel. Warwick, this is the way it's pronounced, I understand. And then all sorts of people arrived that night, you know, like the Supremes and Dylan and, oh, loads of people bringing all the soul food and having a great time. The next day, got into a helicopter and flew over Shea Stadium. The idea was then that the Beatles were going to actually arrive at Shea Stadium and land in the centre field. But this was all cancelled because they thought this was too dangerous. So the very next uh, day when it actually took, we drove, we went there in a limousine, got into the, um, into the dressing room and uh, Mal had four guitars to get out to centre stage. I said, all right, I'll come with you. I'll take two, you take two. So I followed Mal. I left the dressing room and I come out through this big tunnel. And uh, then suddenly, as we've come out into the open, this crescendo of noise, this whole wall of noise greeted you. There's 56,000 plus people. And it's only Mal and I carrying two guitars apiece. And running towards the stage, I think, 
God, what's going to happen now if I fall over or trip over and break a guitar? Or, you know, you, all sorts of funny things race through, race through your mind. Anyway, put the uh, guitars, I left them on the side of the stage and now we're staying there to look after, you know, set everything up for the boys because I've hightailed it back down to the uh, dressing room and then it was their turn. We all sort of lined up. It's like a cup final, you know. And we stood in this tunnel way and we heard Ed Sullivan announce the Beatles and uh, we walked out. And I, again, that wall of noise that I said to you what happened to Mal and I when we went out with the guitars was nothing com compared to the noise that we're now greeting us from. And actually the noise, the, 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 the sheer enthusiasm of the Beatles fans, your, your, your whole being was, was shaking. And so Alf Bicknell, Hazelmere crumpet delivery man, found himself in America, living a life of first-class travel and luxury hotels as trusted henchman to the most famous group in the world. Only natural then that sooner or later they'd meet up with the most famous singer in the world, Elvis Presley. We all arrived in Bel Air and out the, everybody's jumped out of the cars, you know, John, Paul, George, Ringo, and all trotted in one at a time through the door. And as Elvis standing at the door, immaculate in his dress, red shirt, a pair of black pants on and really absolutely bandbox condition as I would call it. And he stood at the door and greeted everybody, you know. And as we walked, as we walked through, he shook hands and welcomed everybody. And I was the last one through the door, as usual. And he also took me by the hand and shook me, you know, welcome to my home, sir. Thank you very much. And is is Alf shaking hands uh, with the great man himself. And it was a tremendous night for about five or six hours. And they boogied a little bit and played guitars and Ringo tapping away and... Uh, Television's going, but no sound, just the pictures. And then we were uh, in this big room near the front door and Elvis was there playing rolling dice and that sort of thing. And they got a big centre fireplace with a wall around it and Ringo and I are sitting on this wall, supping a scotch and coke. And uh, I said to Ringo, I said... I yeah, it's something I don't quite understand. I said, Elvis is one man. I said, look at all these guys around. He's got about 12 guys. He said, you mean the Memphis Mafia? I said, yeah, there's 12 of them. And there was a pause. He says, so? I said, there's four of you. I said, there's only three of us to look after you. So the punchline was then, you know, Ringo, what, what, what do you want to raise? Back home from the feverish excitement of the American tour, Alf was looking forward to a bit of time off, a bit of relaxation. A bit of fishing. Lennon, though, had other plans. This was a day that I was going to go fishing early one morning. Now, that's my, that's my hobby. That's what I like to do. I like to sit under the trees away from everybody and just have water. I'm a typical Scorpio when it comes to that. I like to see the water going by and the, and the float bobbing up and down in the water. And just as I'm going to go out the door, the phone rang. Uh... But history records itself now. It says it was a good thing that I did. I picked the phone up. Um, I said, yeah, hello. That's you, Alf. I says, yeah. yes, John. Hey, what are you doing? Um, I said, it sounds as though I'm coming round to you. So with that, the fishing gear is gone. And I've jumped in because the limb was always parked outside my door. And uh, I've jumped into the limb and I've gone round to John's. And, and as was always, I rat-tat-tat on the door and just walk in. I mean, that was it. But I was announced, oh, I was going to say, it's me. And John was sitting in the kitchen with a mug of tea and a pile of toast and all that. All right, la. I said, yeah, sit down. A cup of tea. We sat there. We had some toast and smoked a few cigarettes. We talked about things in general. And uh, I said, w w what are we doing? So he said, um... You come along with me. So Kenwood is a big, it was a big house. So we go up the stairs, along, down this long corridor, uh, to the room at the, the at the end of the house, which was pro the room was probably about thirty foot square, thereabouts. And there is nothing in the room. There's no curtains, no carpets on the floor, no furniture, just this <laughs> one little solitary light bulb in the in the middle of the room. 
Johnston, and I'm, I'm looking at him, and he's looking at me with a whimsical look on his face, and that's, yeah. He said, uh, we're going to paint this. What do you think? I said, yeah, great, magic. And I was thinking to myself, Alf was going fishing. This is like, uh, you know, one day off in about three months, and I'm going fishing, and I end up in an empty room with John Lennon. So uh, I said, well, yeah, OK, we'll paint it. I said, where's the stuff? Oh, you'll have to go and get the stuff, he said. So we're walking back down the corridor now, down the stairs, and I'm saying, yeah, OK, um, we want steps, we want sponges, we want buckets, we want paint brushes, and we want paint. John, what colour paint shall I get? Pause. Red? I said, red? Yeah, OK. So... Because in Waybridge, everybody everybody knew us in in Waybridge, you know, outside the hardware store, and I'm I'm loading the car the, the back of the limb up with these step ladders and buckets and tins of paint. This paint, red paint. Where are you going to paint? I didn't dare tell him. So anyway, I go back, and uh, John and I spent uh, a week painting this room, the ceiling, the walls, the doors, the window frames. Everything was red. And uh, in between a little smoke and a and a little glass of a can of beer, um, sit down, listening to music, packing up for an hour or two. And in, in the next room, he had a scale Ectrix, you know. We'd be in there buzzing with the little motor cars and then, then we'd stop and then we'd go back and play there. And then he had a great big, uh, big organ downstairs in his lounge. Uh, this is all going on in the, between. When we got fed up with painting, we'd do something else, you know. And this big organ, and he had one of these funny things on the end of the thing you know you could press it and get different sounds out of it we sit there like uh, Reginald Dixon at <laughs> Blackpool you know that was a moment I reflect on now and so I'm glad I picked that phone up instead of going fishing because I've had plenty of opportunities to go fishing since and had I not picked that phone up then my opportunity to have spent all those hours with John Lennon painting a room and playing different games would have been gone forever Alf Bicknell had now been with the Beatles, often day and night, for nigh on two years. And in that time, there'd been some pretty hairy moments. But if the attention of several thousand hysterical pubescents was enough to put the wind up, it was nothing compared to the attention of Imelda Marcos. We went to the Manila Hotel. In the room, we're all sitting around drinking tea or whatever it was sort of early afternoon and the television was on and it was uh, the, the television announcer suggested that a time was going to be uh, spent with um, Imelda Marcos and her people at their home for a dinner or a banquet and sort of in, in one voice the Beatles said oh no we're not and uh, anyway that seemed to go off for a little while went away and, and did a they did a show they were doing the two the two concerts they did the, did the first one and um, on the way back to the hotel we were going to have a few hours and then go back again. Things started getting a bit tricky. We noticed that uh, the security was disappearing. We got to the hotel again. There was uh, The boys were in one part of the hotel. And then Brian went for a meeting with various um, police people and obviously people from the Marcos crowd. And having this meeting with Brian Epstein in this room and I went with Brian and I'm running backwards and forwards. They were trying to diplomatically resolve the situation but whatever message I went back with with from Brian to the boys they wouldn't budge an inch they had no way that and at that time I had no idea why they were re refusing to do it um, and this goes to show you that four very young guys were very worldly and knew what was going on in the world and I didn't really have uh, any knowledge of this at all uh, anyway they said no so we, we did our next concert the second one and now we have no security at all. We're coming back to the uh, to the hotel after the concert. Uh, I'm in the car behind the boys with a guy called Bob Whitaker, who was one of the photographers. And we've got a police lieutenant in the front who was actually in charge of the thing. He's the only guy that actually stayed his ground and did his job. He's the only policeman, the only one. And... Um, Bob Whitaker's having a go at this guy, so I say, well, you know, what's wrong with the police? And I'm sort of saying to Bob Whitaker, you know, it's a diplomatic thing, you know, it's best to, to, to say nothing and keep out of it. So 
we, we arrived at the hotel, we packed and eventually got to the airport and this is where all the the pictures are worldwide now, world famous of us all having a punch up in the airport concourse and there's one photograph of me at the top of a flight of stairs with uh, I'm on my knees and there's a guy a manila Filipino either side of me and there's an airline bag hanging off my arm and it's got all these pieces of carved ivory in that, it's worth a heck of a lot of money and uh these two guys, and it said about Alf Bittner being kicked in the leg, etc. Um, further from the truth, these guys picked me up and threw me down a flight of the airport steps. Paul and I, I think it was, ended up running along behind a load of nuns. I can't recall that, how the incident happened, but the, suddenly the next thing was that we ended up on a plane and breathed a sigh of relief, and the first voice that spoke up was, was, uh, was Ringo, and he said... We could have been killed here, lah. Even less frequently utilised were the vocal and sound effect talents of Alf Bicknell. Abbey Road had a had a room, had a little, like, cupboard there with all sorts of funny little things in them, you know, uh, for, for doing sound effects and various things. And they were doing Yellow Submarine. And between them, they work out these ideas. And Anyway, they ended up with an old tin bath and a piece of chain. And... Um, John in the background, at full steam ahead, Mr. Motion. Then you'd hear the the anchor chain going down. <laughs> that was Elf. That was Elf doing that. That's my sound effects job. Also in the singing in the in the choir, no less, along with uh, with Patty and uh, Neil, Mal, and George Martin, who were just a, a couple of the engineers, and we all we all done the done the choir bit. Yeah, I should have got a contract for that. And, uh, yeah, but it's good. I, I I love it when I hear it. I, I say, else on that record, you know. <laughs> In the time. Yellow Submarine, featuring the criminally uncredited Alf Bicknell, whose role in the studio extended far beyond the mundane matters of recording. Up past 10, 11 o'clock at night, somebody would say, that, I'm hungry, I could do with a drink. And uh, I said, shall I get some food? Yeah, great idea, Alf. So Alf would jump in the limb, go into the West End, and there was a particular Italian restaurant I used to use, uh, just uh, opposite Liberties there. Uh, not Liberties, um, Selfridges. And uh, I would go in there and we'll, we'll get the menu, and I'd go back to the studio, and they're still recording, and I'd go round with the menu and, and a piece of paper, and I would take in it all down what they would like to eat, their starter and their main course and their wine and blah, everything else. And uh, I'd go back to the restaurant. I would sit there. They'd bag everything up in a hamper, the silver, serviettes, the plates, all the food, put it in the back of the limb, back to Abbey Road. I would set it all out. I used to love this bit. Glasses, everything, all shine, polished, all set up for all of us. And then I'd walk into the studio, usually with a serviette over here, trying to be a little bit funny, you know, over the arm. And... Uh, it went quiet for a moment, and I say, gentlemen, dinner is served. But if all was well in the studio, the pressures of the road were beginning to tell. This came towards the end of 1966 in, uh, in San Francisco, a very cold night. And uh, they, Tony Barrow recorded that last concert. Um, and after the show, they was in the dressing room. We were sort of sitting on the side of a, a settee or something. I sat down and... John sat down on my right. I was sitting there having a drink and having a smoke, and uh, John said, just casually, well, casually I say that, but to everybody that was listening, or anybody that was listening, said, um, that's it. And I looked at him and said, that's it. Well, you know, um, no more touring. That's the end of the line. I said, well, that's fine i said you know when when it's all over we get back and get it all sorted out i said um i would like to uh, to leave now and um with that i i packed up towards the end of uh, of 66 working for them it was um i packed up at the right time i I'd, I'd done the two I'd, you know i've been around the world a couple of times with them and uh now was a time for me to sort of uh get back to <laughs> some sort of normal life. That was normal by this time. I mean, that was normal for me. All that 
I ever did for the Beatles. Whatever needed to be done was done. There was never a question of if Epi was there uh, or Neil or any of the boys. Very rare did anybody... They, Epi, in fact, never, ever asked me, has that been done or have you done this? Should you do this? Should you do that? The three of us used to just work around and whatever you see, it didn't matter what it was. If it was a pair of boots before they went on stage with a little grubby and you, you automatically picked them up and just cleaned them. Somebody, cup of tea, you'd go and make it. Just a, it was family. For those two eventful years, Alf Bicknell was one of the Beatles' closest confidants. 30 years on from the first meeting, how does he remember them, individually? When I think of Paul, I don't think of Paul, you know, singing Long and Winding Road, I don't think of him singing that. I think of the time when Paul's given me a shout and he's asked me to go round to his house um, and to pick him up and I've had breakfast with him and I said, where are we going? He said, I'll, I'll get ready in a minute. So he, he goes away and he gets ready and he comes back and he stands in this kitchen and I'm just finishing off my tea uh, and I nearly choke on my tea and I look at him, he's got a long overcoat on, an old cloth cap, a pair of tortoiseshell glasses, an old scarf wrapped round his head, and a, and a stick-on moustache. And he said, I said, where are we going? He said, we're going shopping. I said, what are we going shopping for? He said, we're going round the Portobello Road, he says, in various places. I want to look looking for a grandfather clock. So we spent our time in and out of junk shops and people, everybody knew that it was Paul McCartney. You know, I think of him that way. I think of George in a, in a way that... Um, we were playing cards at the back of a plane. We were uh, with uh, Mary Wells and uh, King Curtis and all these other people on the plane. And it was, this was a charter flight from one state, state to another, one city to another in America. And John said something, and I threw the cards on the table, and I walked down the plane and sat in a seat halfway down the plane. Because he said something, and uh, I didn't like it. And better than sort of argue back, I walked away from it. And the next thing was this shadow came down the side of the plane and sat down beside me and, uh, some, and I didn't look up. I just sat there and somebody pushed a big glass of scotch and coke and nudged me to take it. And I looked and it was George and we spent the rest of the time he sort of saying, well, John doesn't mean it, you know. And uh, we spent the rest of that plane journey just talking about um, us and people and affection and how people should treat each other you know and uh, John I'll always remember obviously because of the painting of the red room and things like that and throwing the hat away and, and inviting me to become a roadie Ringo I remember because he phoned me at two o'clock in the morning when Zach was born you know and he said we lived uh, Jean and I and Mark we lived in Devonshire close just at the back of the BBC in London and uh, Ringo says oh can you come quick he said I think Maury's going to have the baby so I jumped in the car and I flew down across Harley Street and Wimpole Street and Marylebone High Street and I got into Montague Square and picked uh, Ringo and Maureen up to take her to the hospital, which was Queen Charlotte's Hospital, was out towards West London, Chiswick Way. And we're driving down the Bayswater Road, you know, sort of 60 or 70 mile an hour as fast as traffic would allow us that time of the morning. And I'm saying, don't have it now, Maureen, don't have it now, Maureen. And then we got into Queen Charlotte's Hospital, you know. So I have individual thoughts and pleasures on my thinking of the Beatles and if I can carry on just telling the stories and the things that happened to me and making the real Beatle fans happy that's fine by me Alf Bicknell, loyal and faithful to the end the events of those two years transformed the face of pop forever but what of the Beatles themselves had they changed the only one that really never changed at all in again it's it's my in my opinion um is george hadn't changed at all george was the same sweet guy that he that he was when from the first moment that i met him when he banged his head <laughs> you know it's uh it's difficult i mean whatever i say how much they changed mark it's only it, it is only my my opinion and i'm i was just their driver the Alf Bicknell story was presented by Mark Radcliffe and produced in Manchester by Mark Riley.
is a new British film telling the story of the early days of the Beatles in Hamburg and the fifth Beatles, Stuart Sutcliffe. You can win free tickets to see the film before release at a cinema near you by tuning to Lynn Parsons on The Lunchtime Show, 12 till 2 p.m. Free tickets to the Backbeat movie on The Lunchtime Show, 12 till 2.